Hello. Hi, is this Gary? Yep. All right, well, let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We're very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening, who is responsible for eight gold singles, 17 top 40 hits, 45 million records sold worldwide, and four gold albums. We're very excited to welcome the one and only Gary Lewis. You're on the air live with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome to the show, Gary. All right, well, thank you very much. Well, I know you probably don't remember me, Gary, because you meet so many people. <laughs> I met you at the Colorado State Fair in the 90s, and you were awesome. Oh, I do remember that gig, though. It, it was funny yeah, because it, I actually brought well, you up a record album to uh, autograph, and you were, like, freaking out because it was, like, one of your first albums or something. You were bringing it all around all the band members to show them. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I still get a kick out of all that old stuff. Wow. I don't you imagine know, how I looked then and yeah. now and all that. Well, I don't imagine you get tired of playing the old hits, huh? Oh, I don't get tired of playing the hits. I mean, they're they're what put me wherever I am. For sure, for sure. You know, so yeah. I mean, people ask me that a lot too. Don't you get tired of playing those songs? Which is kind of a silly question. Mm -hmm. I mean, why would anybody get tired of it? <laughs> well, that's what makes you Man, so great. I don't know anybody that's grateful for what they have and get tired of their songs. Very true. Some very spoiled TV actors do, Gary. <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. I'm glad you said it. <laughs> so the first thing I want to ask you, uh, we're going to be doing a tribute later on, but, of course, uh, somebody uh, from your era that was responsible for uh, exposing a lot of artists like yourself to the masses of, of the teen generation that passed away, and that was Dick Clark. Would you like to say something about Dick's passing? Well, yeah, I mean, Dick, Dick Clark, uh, he, he was right there at the very beginning of my career. I mean, uh, right after we recorded This Diamond Ring, the very first tour we ever did to go out on the road and promote it was uh, one of those Dick Clark Caravan of Stars tours where, uh, where about 10 acts get on a bus and do six to eight weeks of one-nighters. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Dick Clark, he, he traveled on those tours too um and acted as the mc for all the shows so i got to know him real well and and the cool thing about him is that he never acted like like uh, a parent to any of the kids or anything he acted just like those kids mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and that that was so cool i thought you know he's just a he understanded all i um, understand it understood all the old um all the old people in the business, he knew the the young people that liked them, and he just dealt with the kids like a kid himself. Right, for sure. Well, when you think of those days and you think of shows like American Bandstand and, and you think of Soul Train and, and shows like from that era, I know Soul Train yeah. mostly had black acts, but they also had some white acts on there too. And now we have, like, what do we have? We have the X Factor. We have American Idol. What, what do you think of, of today's shows compared to the past? I mean, it's not the same, is it? It isn't the same, and I don't, I don't, even, I don't watch any of them. You know, I mean, I, you know, I don't understand what's going on with television today. I mean, who wants to watch two guys in a swamp hunting for alligators <laughs> with their hands? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, what the heck is that? You know, and then. Then other people, like those American pickers, they they go to all the junkyards around the United States and buy things. Wow, that's really interesting. I mean, that's entertainment, boy. Would you kind of say that, that kind of variety shows and things like that being on TV when you were growing up, do you think that had anything to do with influencing you to be a musician? Uh, well, actually, no. I mean, uh, I... I played drums since I was five years old and, and guitar since I was 14. So when I was in, in my first year of college out, out in Los Angeles, um, I, I didn't even think about what I was going to be doing. You know, I was just having fun being away from my house for the first time in my life going to college, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, an awful lot of fun. And then all of a sudden, boom, the Beatles! Wow, man, I said, hey, this is great stuff. I'm going to get a band together from uh, my different classes at school, you know, bandmates and uh, rehearse, and maybe we can do something. And so it was actually the Beatles that were the major influence. 
So my favorite question to always ask people like yourselves, when, when you look at the Beatles or some say Elvis, and you're like, I want to do that, was it the gold records, the money, or was it the girls, Gary? <laughs> uh, well, actually, you know, that's very funny you would say that, because I thought, hey, man, if I can get a band and people like us, uh, you know, we'll get lots of beer and chicks. <laughs> That, that's really, I mean, that is really what I thought at first, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, it just took us so far beyond that, you know. It, it was absolutely wonderful. We, we auditioned out of Disneyland, got the job for summer of 64, and, um, and that's where our producer from Liberty Records saw us. He, he was out at the park with his family. And uh, he said, hey, after our show, he said, hey, I'd love to talk to you guys about recording. I'm a producer at Liberty Records. And, and all of us went, yeah, right. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so then he gave me his card, and it was true, yeah. Wow. So, you know, that, that's how it happened. And then we had seven top tens in a row. That's all history from there. You know, you know, we're talking about getting chicks in this and that. It kind of like putting a suggestion in their minds that maybe you were a Playboy and maybe that could help you get chicks. I guess there's an interesting story about how you got the name of the Playboys for the band. Well, right? you know, that that's that's the only thing that there's no story to. Ah. I mean, there's really no story. It was just a comment made uh, when two of the guys were late for a rehearsal. You know, they walked in finally, and, and our bass player said, Hey, you bunch of playboys. <laughs> and I said, Well, let's, yeah, let's keep that. You know, wow. so there's really no story to it. There you go. Well, you know, how but would you we were playboys. Yeah. Well, well, for sure. Why not? I mean, why not? I mean, I thought, Oh, man, after seeing, you know, the Beatles, you know, all, all the girls trying to just grab their clothes and their hair and everything. <laughs> And I said, yeah, I want to get my stuff ripped off, too. <laughs> so, I mean, and sure enough, uh, boy, did that ever happen. I mean, we had to learn how to run real fast. You know, you know I, get, I've seen you a few times, get, Gary, and I think maybe that's why you wear leather pants, because <laughs> that way they can't rip them off so easy. Leather pants. I always wore leather pants. <laughs> <laughs> Very versatile. <laughs> you know, I, I yeah, found but, it. but I mean, you know, after after we were caught a few times, mm -hmm. you know, but we we weren't fast enough getting out of the stage door to get to our car before wow. the whole crowd emptied out. So we weren't fast enough a few times. So then we we really started running real fast to get to the car, and we we just made it. I mean, you know, they would actually rip hair out you know and and boy, when it started getting painful i said okay uh that, that's enough <laughs> you know thank you very much we'll just stay there until we'll stay in the theater until the crowd disperses completely well well i know you probably get some young ones too now but you know of course you probably get a lot of baby boomers that came back in the, the 60s sure. and the 50s uh, are they still able to catch you i mean <laughs> Oh, are you kidding me? All those walkers? <laughs> <laughs> you're you're a good sport, Gary. You're good. Well, you, know, you know what is funny though? I mean, I mean, not funny, but it's just it's great actually. Is that we're playing to the same people that we played to in the '60s, except now they're bringing their kids, exactly, and, and they're bringing their kids. You know, yeah. I mean, we're so we're playing to three generations. I mean, and, uh, how many how many people can say that nowadays? I mean, a lot of the acts that we we have now that are like on American Idol or whatever, they're they're here for a couple of years. But God, like, how many years has it been now since you've been uh, doing records? How, how many years? Yeah, forty eight. Wow. Jeez. Yeah, I know that's really cool. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm I'm just thrilled to death, you know, and and um, I I love being in this business. Uh, you know, I just love everything about it. You know, even though a lot of it is hard and stuff like that, it, it's all part of the same business, you know. And I do love what I do. Let me guess, you've got to have a wall with all your gold records on it. I do. There you go. Why not? I mean, I, I do. And it's very funny, you know, initially, 
we had the eight gold records, you know, right when we first recorded them. Mm -hmm. But over all these years, they they've sold so many more millions that like I've got, I mean, they keep sending me gold records. You know, <laughs> oh well, it sold another million. Here's another record. You know, so I got a whole bunch of them. Wow, and, and it's incredible too because I want you to talk about this because I know you have a brand new song, and we'll play that after the interview. Great. Great. Yeah, it's a new song that myself and my bass player, Nick Rather, wrote together. And uh, we wanted to stay away from the record companies and just do it ourselves, you know. I mean, way, way too involved if you're going to get with record companies. Uh, I just wanted to make it easily accessible to people, you know. So we, we uh, made it available on, on whatever download site there is. And... Um, it's it's a song about you know breaking up this couple breaks up and it takes the guy a long time like six months to to finally get over her and then when he's over her she wants to come back and start it up again mm. you know so that that's what the tune is about and the guy doesn't know if he wants to or not but it's a good rock and roll tune Wow, there you go. And straight, ahead, straight ahead rock and roll tune. So would you say it's pretty much like the old songs that we heard from you as far as maybe like the beat and the tempo? Or... Oh, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I definitely think that when people hear it, um, if, they, if they listen close, they'll be able to recognize that it's me. Mm -hmm. And plus, I recorded uh, the new song just like I recorded all the old, the old tunes. Um, putting just enough instruments on it to get the point across, and and I never used everything that was available in the studio so that I could always reproduce it live. Right. You know, n n you know, you put strings and horns and all these extra things on it and all that, and then you can't uh, you can't perform right. it live. Right. Well, the thing that was great about you, and, and not a lot of singers could do this, is you also had hits with cover songs, too. Right, right. I know. It, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, I I actually had a hit with Del Shannon's tune, Runaway, and uh, Love Potion number 9. Uh, let me see. You're 16, the one Ringo did in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I've, I've had hits on... Uh, on tunes like that also. So let me ask you, Gary, how did you decide, because I know that you had started out as kind of like the drummer and you played, you know, the guitar, right. but how did you decide to take the step of basically becoming the lead singer as well? Was that your decision? Well, I was always the lead singer, I mean, even behind the drums. But, uh, but I, I, I just had way, way too much energy to be trapped back there, you know. I couldn't see the people, they couldn't see me because of all the symbols in front of me. Um, I wanted to be up front and see the people. I wanted to, I wanted, wanted to see faces and everything. So after the first uh, maybe year and a half, um, in 66, I hired a drummer and uh, went out and uh, played rhythm guitar. And, and that's, that's what I've been doing ever, ever since 66. Uh, occasionally, I do still go back and play drums, uh, uh, one song during the set, you know, and set it up like, uh, well, if you didn't know, I was the original drummer, and, mm -hmm. you know, so so a lot of people know that, and a lot don't. They said, oh, oh, magnificent, <laughs> we're going to hear him play drums, great. Well, I, I guess there's like a little story behind that, because I guess it was kind of your mom, Patty, who I thought was a lovely lady, definitely lovely lady. And Wonderful she, woman. Absolutely. I, I know you really, you know, were close. Uh, yep. Uh, I want to know, like, is it true that because she wasn't quite so sure your dad would support you having a band for whatever reason, did she <laughs> not Did she not secretly fund Gary Lewis and the Playboys, and she actually got you lessons by Buddy Rich? <laughs> well, um, I'll, I'll tell you about both of those things, but but my mom, my mom didn't get me lessons from Buddy Rich. Uh, Buddy Rich was a friend of my dad's, mm -hmm. and uh, he was always over at our house, you know, just hanging out with my dad and doing whatever they did. 
Uh, and every time this guy would come over, he'd say, he'd say to me, come on, kid, let's go out in the back there where the drums are, and I'll, I'll show you some stuff. And, you know, I just thought it was a friend of my dad's. What did I know? I was, I was like five. You know, so he's showing me all this stuff, and uh, that, that's definitely where I got interested in drums and, and started playing. And it wasn't until I was like 12 years old that uh, I found out this is Buddy Rich. Hmm. I went, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> I took lessons from Buddy Rich. Can there you, you go. believe this? Wow. Uh, so anyway, my mom, she, uh, she you know, she said, uh, well, okay, I'll buy you the amps and the guitars and the drums and this and that and this and that. And, uh, but don't tell your father because uh, if this whole thing fails, then I'm going to have to come up with an excuse as to where the money went. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, I we didn't tell my dad and uh he didn't i had a band until diamond ring was at number one and i got my first gold record and i took it down to paramount studios and uh presented him with the first gold record he says when did you do this (laughs) (laughs) so you know it it was cool and it was it was great well it's cool for you because looking back it's got to be a matter of pride to know that you could have been like a lot of them do. We, we know a lot of relation of, of famous celebrities, and they just hawk off their parents' names. And you did it on your own, Gary. Right, absolutely right. I wanted to. Um, the, the first audition out at Disneyland, um, it, it was a good thing, but we weren't Gary Lewis and the Playboys. We were just Gary and the Playboys, so mm-hmm. nobody could think anything else, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's exactly like I wanted it because we had to audition up against like ten other bands, you know, mm-hmm. for that job. And um, we we got it just on uh, what we did, right. how we sounded. Well, you had and, your own band. The, you I know, mean, it's a it's a good thing, and plus it worked out really good because I ended up uh, doing something that my dad doesn't do. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. I you mean, know, I mean that way. Now I've got my own identity, my own career. I'm not ever compared to him because I don't do what he does. And and you did your own band rather than joining, remember Dino, Desi, and Billy? That was Dean Martin's son and Desi Arnaz's. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, they they were like five years younger than me. I mean, when they recorded, they were like 14, you know, and I was like 19. So, you know, I I never even really knew them. Yeah. Well, you know, I was really surprised, and I wouldn't even say this except according to what I read, unless it's wrong, because we've gotten a few things wrong here because of the stupid Internet, and you can tell me if it's true <laughs> or not. Uh, did you not, were you not quoted as saying that you didn't feel you had great strength in your voice, so that's why they did uh, overdubbing? Well, um, well I, I didn't. I, I had a tremendously inexperienced voice. Um the good thing was is that I had good pitch, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I always hit the notes I was supposed to hit and everything. And the only overdubbing on my voice that we did is that I doubled my voice. Yeah. You know, sang the original track, and then I I doubled my voice, too, to make it, you know, fatter and mm-hmm. fuller. Uh, but, but that's the only overdubs on my voice we ever did. Well, I think your voice is great. I always thought it had a, a very unique sound. How would you describe your music? I, I maybe I'm wrong. I describe it as as bouncy, happy music. <laughs> bouncy. B- bouncy, happy. It's happy music. It's not hate or anger based. Um, you know, the proof right there is longevity of 48 years. Absolutely. And you, you know, know, people like it. They pass it down to their kids and grandkids. I get, I get emails from little seven-year-old girls saying, "I just love your songs because my grandmother sings sings them to me to get me to fall asleep." Wow, you know, at night. So that, you know, that's that's just wonderful stuff. Well, I know there's another group that really love you because you do a lot for them and you do shows and stuff. You were a veteran, and you really yeah. you really respect today's vets, don't you? I love veterans. You know, they're they're um, they're a one on on my advocacy list. You know, I will always advocate for the vets because um, 
when I when I started hearing about, I mean, I was in the service '67 and '68, mm. and uh, you know, hearing about all this stuff when the vets would return from Vietnam and people were spitting on them and calling them baby killers and this and that. I said, well, man, that's just got to stop, you know. For sure. So so that's when I started being all for the vets. And we do shows for them now. We go play golf tournaments to raise money, you know, for the awareness of uh, disabled vets and all that. And, uh, yeah, so I, I stay pretty active with all that. Well, I'm glad to hear that because they definitely are our unsung heroes, and we're starting to realize that they're heroes, and I think we should realize even more because they do so much for this country. That's right. Absolutely right. You know, I, I think I think they're great, you know, and they deserve, they deserve to come home with excellent VA care. And I've, been, I've also gone around to many, many VA hospitals, you know, just, taking a little tour in there, saying hi to all the people and stuff, mm -hmm. and just seeing how things are run. And uh, compared to, like, how it was uh, in that Tom Cruise movie, Fourth of July, um, you know, they've come such a long way, and they're, they're, they're staffed so well, great doctors, real, real clean facilities. I mean, they, they have really turned around from uh, when they were just dirty old rat infested places. Mm -hmm. That's good. Now I understand that when you came back from your tour in Vietnam that you didn't go right back into music. You actually had a music shop for a while and was giving drumming lessons. Was there any right. reason why you didn't kind of just jump right back into trying to go back to being Gary Lewis of Gary Lewis and the Playboy? Yeah, I'll give you three reasons. Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, and the Doors. <laughs> right. <laughs> Those were the reasons right there. And I didn't want to just play play whatever was going on at the time and sing out of my style just for the sake of staying in it. Uh, so I just uh, bowed out of the whole thing because, you know, music got way, way harder and more complex than I was prepared to do. So I bought a music store in Los Angeles. And... Uh, from, uh, let me see, 72 to 84. And that's what I did. I uh, sold guitars and drums and gave lessons on both. And then in 84, this one agent from Indiana gave me a call and said, Hey, man, the 60s are coming back. <laughs> I went, yeah, yeah, cool, right. Okay, nice talking to you. <laughs> we, we always said, have room for the old kids. He said, no, no, really, really, I can get you 60 to 100 dates a year. And I said, well, if you can get them, I'll play them. You know, and since 84, that's what's been happening. Wow. Well, we know uh, you almost formed another group that kind of didn't happen. Okay, we had on, on the radio show here... One of my favorites, which she was from that group, we had on Susan Cowsill, who like I've had a crush on forever, ever since I was a kid. I'm like the same age. But you had you had her brother in your life, and you were going to do a band with him, brother Billy, right? Yeah, yeah, Bill Cowsill and myself. Um, I believe it was 1972. We we all went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, because um, that's where all my musicians were from and our arranger leon russell he was from there too mm -hmm. so we all went back to tulsa oklahoma and formed a band called medicine and we recorded uh, you know at capitol records and came out with some tunes that were pretty good but uh, we didn't have the right uh uh person to handle the business we mm -hmm. didn't we didn't you know we just had a bunch of musicians we didn't have a person well, the business. We just thought, oh, well, we'll do everything ourselves. Right. Well, we found out we couldn't do that. Um, so it just it just failed. You know, and we played around Kansas and Oklahoma. Uh, you know, and it was fun. It was fun. I enjoyed it. You know, um, I, I still did all my uh, 60s hits and all that stuff. But, but most of the other time... Uh, Bill Calcill and the other people in the band were singing, and I was just able to concentrate on lead guitar. Right. I was just I was just standing kind of like in the back and playing lead guitar and really getting a kick out of that, you know. But uh, so that that uh, 
you know, it didn't it didn't last. Well, you know, maybe you could get together with Susan someday. That'd be awesome to see you sing with her sometime. Well, I hadn't I hadn't thought about it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it, it's just it's just me and my fantasy here. You gotta excuse me. You gotta excuse me. I, I wanted to mention ah, something. You got a crush on her. Oh yes, absolutely. I do. It's terrible. I can tell. All these. See, it, it was okay. Having a crush on her back then because I was her age. So from back then oh, to now, oh, right, right. It, it would have been weird yeah. if I was twenty and she was like twelve. It would have been strange. Oh, yeah, that's cool. But I, I want to mention something, and the reason I want to mention this is because to me, this shows what kind of a guy you are. Okay, I, I know I have heard all kinds of stories about what a great person you are and what what a nice person you are, which is really really great. Is it true that you found out that you have a sister you didn't know about? Oh yeah, <laughs> yes. I, on, uh, now let me see. How did this whole thing start? Uh, this guy who used to who used to be an agent of mine uh, called me one day and said, uh, "This girl is is claiming to be um, your your dad's daughter." And I said, "Really?" So that would mean I have a sister out there somewhere or a half sister and he says well we can find out for sure if you do a dna test so i said well sure why not it'd be nice to find that out plus everybody deserves to find out where they come from uh, i said sure i'll do it so they swabbed my cheek and swabbed hers matched them up and it was like 88 percent that we were related mm -hmm. and if you look at her i mean i don't know if you've seen a picture of her or not but she does look just like my dad. Mm. She really does. So, uh, you know, we we cleared that up um, and to answered those questions if my dad was her dad. And uh, then I I haven't talked to her since. Well, it just I goes. Don't know, I don't even know where she is. It, it just goes to show, though. I mean, a lot of people would come up and, and say that to you or whatever, and, and like. You know, some people say, oh, you're crazy, and they wouldn't care any further, but you actually gave a DNA test. I mean, that's like, it's a little bit more than giving an autograph, Gary. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, I know, but if it, it did, I mean, for somebody to find out the truth about where they come from, it seemed like such a small thing for me to do. It, it didn't, didn't annoy me, it didn't bother me. I had time, mm -hmm. you know, so I just did it. Well, fantastic. I mean, there was no you. sweat. Just one of those medical people came by, swabbed my cheek. See you later. Wow. Did you have any kids, Gary? Yeah, I have a daughter. Um, she Just one daughter. And she was born in 1968 when I was in the Army. Mm -hmm. um, and she's got uh, two kids. So I, I've got two grandbabies there. And my my present wife has four grandkids and I call them mine too well I'll tell you I mean well, you know it's been a few years and you're a grandpa but you look better than uh, Keith Richards <laughs> oh god I hope so <laughs> Well, Gary, uh, during during the interview, we actually, because the show's live, we actually have uh, listeners that will submit questions and things like that as well. And um, we have two questions come in, and they're kind of related. Uh, one, okay. one question was uh, somebody wanted to know, they thought that Gary Lewis and the Playboys had s appeared on the Flintstones, and they wanted to know if that was true. And then the other question was, didn't you guys also do the theme song for another animated series called The Super Six? Absolutely. Super Six! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we did, we did the, uh, the title theme for Super Six Cartoon in 1966 and no we were never on the Flintstones. Aww. Oh. You should have been. I mean unless unless somebody just wrote in a part and you know and and they said well hey hey here's Gary Lewis and the Playboys. I, I think they got you mixed up with the Bo Brummels because they, they were have, they yeah. were on the Flintstones. Oh, okay. Well, that's cool. I don't know if you think the Bo sound Brummels, was that's that's very funny. They they were on the show the very first the very first concert I ever did. Back in in '64, uh, mm -hmm. me and the Bo Brummels, I liked them. 
Well, l- let me ask you because you know everybody thinks. Of, of course, you were from a different era, but your music was was happy and, and like you said, it's okay to say bouncy and this and that. And then we all saw like later on in the seventies and eighties, it was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. What about? You know, in, in your era, I mean, some of the groups you hung around with and stuff, and you yourselves, I mean, you don't have to mention names, but you, you guys, other than hanging out with some chicks now, I mean, it was, really wasn't all that sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? It wasn't all that what? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I mean, you guys weren't, you know... We so, didn't even know what drugs were. There you go. There you go. That's what I'm getting at. I didn't think you would, because you can't sing that I mean, well. I mean, we really didn't, you know. Uh, it was, um, it was just, it was just too much fun mm-hmm. at the very beginning to, to even think about that right. stuff. I'm, I mean, the sex thing is okay. That's in there. <laughs> but <laughs> no drugs or alcohol, you know. I was just going to say you couldn't have the voice you have and, and be taking drugs because, you know, you, well, you had a high-pitched voice. And I, I, No, I, I didn't even know what they were until I was like 28. Oh, there you go. You know, I, I want to tell you, and I don't want to, like, talk too much about your dad, because I don't want to dwell on that. I, I know it's it's been good, and it's been hard being Jerry Lewis' son. Yeah, but it, it really does. It doesn't matter if you talk about him to me. Okay. Hey, my dogs are going crazy. Shut up! <laughs> Obviously, they're not a Jerry Lewis fan. I, I don't know. Yeah, right. But the thing that I want... I, you know, it, even though I've seen all his movies billions of times, whenever they come on, I watch them again. Well, you know, I, mean, I, I love his work. His work is the greatest. And, and like I said, you're you're a good person, Jerry, uh, Gary. You really are a good person. Uh, Thank the, you. The thing, not only seen his movies, you were in a few of his movies too, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I played uh, I played my dad as a boy. He was having like a a daydreaming sequence, you know. Um, so he was thinking back, and mm-hmm. boom, there I was at 12 years old singing a little song to a girl. And I finished my tune, and then I was sitting there, and then my dad faded in. So both of us together um, sang a little harmony line leading out, and then I faded out. It was in Rockabye Baby. Right. And then you sang and the then, song to uh, Way Way Out too, right? Wasn't that you? Yeah, Way yeah. Way Out. We did, that was the title, uh, the t- the title theme of the of the movie over the credits. Right. And uh, that was that was really fun too. I loved that. And then we were also um, in Family Jewels. You know, my mm-hmm. dad played seven different parts. Right. Um, and uh, you know, one of the parts he was an airplane pilot. And uh, before they took off, this one lady said, Captain, Captain, can you please turn that music down? I can't even hear myself. Uh, And he says, okay, no trouble at all. And he opens up this little closet, and me and the Playboys are stuffed in there (laughs) playing. We're just playing along. He says, would you hold it down? Slams the door, and that was the end of the shot. Wow. Well, I was telling the well, listeners. It was so good. And I I play all those things at our shows, too. Well, that's awesome. I, I like people to see all that stuff. For sure. And then it was and I cool. tell them, this is what I was into before rock and roll. Right. Folks. And and it was good, too, that not only did your dad give you some work, but I feel you kind of gave your dad some work because you were the teenager and your dad was the old guy. And you gave him a job <laughs> on Hullabaloo, didn't you? Well, that's right. You know, <laughs> I mean... When when we did the telethon, I uh, one year I don't remember what year it was, but I said, uh, "Okay, we're going to do just my style here, Dad, uh, as our second song. Do you, so if you want to if you want to come up, uh, you know, and sing with us, that'd be cool." And he said, "No, no, no. I mean, you just you just go right ahead." So we're we're playing the tune, and towards the end, he decides to walk up on stage and just stand in the back. And make like he's singing, you know, mm. he's just kind of lip syncing, and the people were going absolutely crazy. And m- myself and the band, we were we were just laughing, I, you know. The words kept coming out, but we weren't even singing them, you know, because it was lip syncing. Right. <laughs> you know, and oh, it was, you know, you never know what he's going to do. Never, wow. never. So did he they- could he could come up on stage and push the drummer off of his 
Trump stool. Right. <laughs> and he's done that before, too. <laughs> Okay. And he also, he came on stage one time, we were doing a show in Miami, and, and he was there, he came to the show, and he walks up on stage and just unplugs my guitar. <laughs> I said, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> you know, everybody's applauding him. Yay, all right. <laughs> well, you know, so, anybody that if has he's a... ever around, right. y you can never be sure what's going to happen. Well, anybody that... that hasn't been, you know, anybody who's been living in a cave maybe wouldn't know, but people that, that have been out and around certainly know that you made a name for yourself. But in knowing that you made a name for yourself and knowing that you started on your own and didn't really rely on Jerry Lewis's fame, did you yeah. ever feel pressure? I mean, you are funny, but did you ever feel pressure to be funny because your dad's a comedian in addition to being a great singer? No, no, I never felt any pressure. Um, I, I just, I, I never felt... Any anything like that because the humor that I have and that I use is all within the music and within my show. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, it's like anything else. You develop a show, you know, and most of my humor comes from things that happened to me in the band in the past, mm -hmm. and uh, people just really get a kick. All right, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick one here. This, this is an example, and, and it's the absolute truth. I was doing an interview with this 20-year-old uh, girl uh, who was just getting into the radio business, and uh, her station assigned her to come out to our job and interview me. So uh, we're talking, and she says, Gary, I just love all your songs. I said, well, thank you. And I just love your dad so much, too. I said, well, thanks a lot. And she says, she says, yeah, especially that tune, Great Balls of Fire. Oh. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> this is especially funny, Gary, because I was just saying before you come on that I should throw you by saying, oh, yeah, well, your dance song, Great Balls of Fire, and now you're telling me it's happened. Oh, oh, I swear to God it happened. Wow. You know, she was only 20 years old. And I didn't say anything to her. I, I didn't want to scare out of the business already. I, I have the perfect line, Gary. Next time that happens, be like, no, my dad wasn't related to his wife. Because <laughs> Jerry married his cousin, remember? Yeah. Hey, that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> you know, I've got to yeah. ask you as, as we start wrapping this up. Sure. You not only are such a nice guy, but you're so normal. And I'm not saying, like... You shouldn't be normal because you're the son of Jerry Lewis. But let, let's be let's be blunt here. To grow up around Dean Martin, mm -hmm. Sammy Davis Jr., you know Jerry Lewis, the entire Rat Pack, Frank Sinatra. I mean, and you're so normal. It had to be like crazy back then, but it didn't seem to make you nuts. I mean, you're so normal. <laughs> well, it did. I must admit, though, it it did take me uh, quite a long time to figure out what was real, what was most important. Uh, you know how to how to live my life so that I'm happy. You know, it took me a while to get there. You know, but I mean, because I was kind of a cocky little kid. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, even during my recording days and everything, because uh, you know, I, we were we were all me and my brothers. We were raised rich. You mm -hmm. know, so the advice that I can give is if you're raised rich. You better damn well figure out a way to stay that way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> you know, my favorite photo of you that I've ever seen, and this is probably going to be strange to you, is you're on the Howdy Doody show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was great. I was in my little military uniform, too. I'm a little jealous that you're Jerry Lewis's son, but I'm even more jealous that you met Buffalo Bob Smith because he was my yeah, idol. And, yeah, and and did you did you know who Clarabelle the Clown was? It used to be Bob Keishan who was Captain Kangaroo. That's right. Yes. <laughs> you got it. I'm an old guy, Gary. I know all these things. Well, that's cool. That that that's a great bit of trivia right yeah. there. Well, I just want to ask you one more thing, and that sure. is, uh, once again, uh, I don't want to, like I said, dwell too much on your dad because you had such a career on your own, but I was really upset when everything happened with the muscular dystrophy telethon, and one of the things that upset me, of course, was the fact that they took away something that really was his and, and really something he lived for doing, but I really enjoyed seeing you on a telethon every year, and 
it is true they did fire your dad, right? Yes, they did. A lot of people don't know that, you know, um, because my dad isn't speaking about it. Uh, you know, a lot of different theories are coming out, but but the fact is, they fired him. Period. Mm -hmm. That was it. Wow. You know, so he he was just well, he probably still is. He's very hurt, you know. Wow. But he's okay. He's well, doing all right. Well, I'm glad to hear that, and I hope that you know he he carries on because. <laughs> God, like that was such an important thing in his life. And I guess it's just a very humbling thing. I mean, I'm sure you've been humble all these years, and I don't know how humble your dad's been, but I don't care who you are. <laughs> you know, it's it's a lesson. Like, you can lose well, everything, so many people like, grew, overnight. So many people grew up with Jerry Lewis and the MDA telephone, too, yeah. though. It was like, right, it, you know. Right. Um, Martin I, and Lewis were like the Beatles of the 50s. Absolutely, yeah. I, I wanted were. I wanted to mention really quick, Gary, because I don't want to yeah. have us forget this. You actually have some show dates coming up as well. Yes, we do. And, uh, you know, rather than me trying to remember them all right now, uh, just go to GaryListenToPlayboys.com and hit on show dates. One of them, I, I can't, but this is a great lineup, but you actually have a, a couple of shows you're going to be playing with Paul Revere and the Raiders and Herman's Hermits. Right. Right, that right. is a we're lineup. Doing, <laughs> yeah, May May eighteenth, we're doing a show with Paul Revere and the Raiders and Peter Noon. Well, let me tell you, I've never met Peter, but Paul Revere, he is a funny guy. <laughs> he's he's a super nice guy too. Wow. You know, I've I've known him forever, and uh, you know, we play all the time together. It's really great. Yeah, I saw a picture of you. I believe was. Taken, I think it was in a, I don't know when it was, the seventies or maybe in the nineties. But there was a picture of you with Paul Revere and Brian Hyland at the uh, Dick Clark Theater. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that was two thousand six. There you go. There you go. Yeah, because we 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 played uh, at, at Dick Clark Theater down there for the entire year of two thousand six. Okay. Well, I thank you so much for coming on the show. And once again, your website is at. Gary Lewis and the Playboys .com. Perfect. And I'm gonna I'm gonna end this with saying thank you. But before you go, I want you to introduce your new song. I'm gonna let you play DJ. I don't know how much you've done that. <laughs> you definitely could be a DJ. But and it's been such a pleasure to have you on, Gary. We, we think you're thank a legend. You for, well, thanks for having me. Big fan, big fan. So go ahead and introduce okay. your record. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Here is a great song. Well. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a great song. I like this tune. Brand new song. It's on iTunes from any downloadable site that you want to use. And written by myself and my bass player, Nick Rather. This is called You Can't Go Back. Very good. Good night. All right. See you later. Thank you, Gary. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye.